Hi, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our trade policy webinar today. Sorry for the delay in starting, we were just having some technical difficulties. I'm Rowena Hume and I'm the General Manager for Communications and Engagement at Beef and Lamb New Zealand. First up, some housekeeping. For those that, of you that aren't familiar, um, you can easily send us your questions via the chat functionality. The chat box is in the lower right hand corner of your screen. Please join as guest, type in your name and your question and press send. If you can't see the chat window, click the speech bubble on the top right hand end of the screen. We'll also be recording today's webinar. So um, if you're having any problems with connectivity, uh, you can always rewatch us over a cup of tea um, at a later time. The agenda for today's webinar is that first up, we'll have a presentation from New Zealand's top trade negotiator, Vangeli Vitalis, who will talk to us about the global trade policy outlook in the wake of, 20, of, of COVID-19 and its implications for the red meat sector. And then we'll ask Vangeli for questions. Uh, Stephanie Honey will speak next. She's Beef and Lamb's Senior Trade Policy Manager. And Stephanie's going to highlight the work that Beef and Lamb is doing on behalf of farmers to improve our market access globally. And after that, we'll have another question session with both Stephanie and Vangeli. Please put any questions you have into the chat during the presentation so we can collect them for question time. I'm just going to make a few opening remarks before we uh, crack into Vangeli's presentation. So as you know, um, trade policy and open markets are absolutely critical to the red meat sector as we export 95% of our sheep meat exports and over 80% of our beef. Sheep and beef farmers consistently rank improving market access as one of the top things they want beef and lamb to focus on on their behalf, which we do. While a lot of progress has been made in the last few decades, the reality is that agriculture, particularly meat and dairy, remain the most highly protected and subsidised sector globally. While we've saved over 300 million per year in tariffs from the free trade agreements that we've negotiated to date, we still face another 200, over 200 million in tariffs annually. And we also face billions of additional costs through non-tariff barriers and many of our competitors still receive subsidies. Despite all these challenges, New Zealand is the second largest sheep meat exporter just behind Australia and the sixth largest beef exporter globally. And this success is the result of years of close collaboration between our sector and the government, successive governments on trade liberalisation, and also the laser focus of our entire sector from farmers to processing companies on providing a consistent high quality product to our consumers. The trade policy landscape has become incredibly complicated in the last couple of years, particularly following COVID. And today's webinar is really timely to hear what that means for our sector. It is therefore my pleasure to introduce Vangeli Vitalis, who is Deputy Secretary for Trade at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I can't emphasize enough what a huge reputation Vangeli has globally. He has been New Zealand's ambassador to the WTO, where he was the chair of the agricultural negotiations. He has been New Zealand's ambassador to the EU. He was New Zealand's chief trade negotiator when we closed out the Trans-Pacific trade negotiations. And he was also um, New Zealand's chief trade negotiator in our FTA negotiations with Malaysia and ASEAN. He is also a keen fisherman and Phoenix football supporter. So on that note, I'd like to hand over to Vangeli to provide his perspectives. Thank you very much, um, Rowena. It is a real pleasure um, to have this opportunity to speak to you all um, about some of the uh, challenges, but also some of the opportunities that are lying ahead of us. And what I thought I would do today is speak in sort of four parts. First of all, I wanted to give you a sense of how the world has changed. Um, the second is to identify some of the really big themes and challenges that I see out there. The third is to talk um, briefly, because I expect this to come up in the in the question and answer session that we will have um, uh, about some of the very specific negotiating challenges we have, uh, particularly for your sector, uh, as we look out over the next sort of 18 months, and then conclude with uh, sort of an update on our trade recovery strategy uh, that has been recently launched, and then finally with some um, concluding observations. The, the, the main theme I want to leave you with is that um, even though the world is going to be a much more challenging place uh, than we are used to, uh, and that's partly because of COVID, although as you'll see, I argue that COVID essentially has ex accelerated an existing um, trend. Um, 
as a, as a country and as uh, negotiators, we do have agency um, over what is um, uh, this external environment that we're going to have to grapple with. And our partnership with you, and in particular the beef and lamb colleagues that work very closely with us here in Wellington, is an absolutely vital ingredient as far as I'm concerned in terms of the success of what we may and may not be able to achieve. Um, so let me start first with the sort of uh, my contextual point about the world has changed. Um, look, we have had a very good run in trade policy terms for the last sort of nearly two decades since the establishment of the World Trade Organization and when agriculture was finally brought into the rules-based system. Most recently in 2015, at the end of the uh, Nairobi Ministerial Conference of WTO Ministers of Trade, um, we were able to successfully eliminate agricultural export subsidies. That has had a material impact as you heard earlier from Rowena, um, in terms of the savings from your bottom line, uh, in terms of your access internationally. So those rules, that certainty, that transparency that we've enjoyed has been a really important part of the way in which we've thought about the past two decades. Importantly too, the market access opportunities that have been negotiated uh, by successive governments have helped leverage open uh, increasingly um, some of those very important markets. And that's not just a, a case of multilateral negotiations, but it's also been a function of our free trade agreement agenda, uh, the agreement with the 10 ASEAN countries, the agreement most recently with China, with Korea, and of course, CPTPP that Rowena has also um, mentioned. Those have been important foundational blocks for us as we thought about the way in which the world looks ahead. Unfortunately, the last three years, and I do say the last three years because it is not just about COVID, the last three years have posed us with some very, very significant challenges. Let me pick up four particular themes that I see as those um, quite profound difficulties that we're gonna face as we look out ahead, which in my view intensifies the need for us to really collaborate closely as we look out into the future. The first is the global shock that um, COVID has provided. The very important thing to bear in mind here is this is a demand and a supply shock. Um, we are fortunate that many parts of the primary industry sector have weathered the, the crisis well, um, but that is not uh, a working assumption on which we can base the next three to five years. There are going to be big challenges. And unfortunately, we're seeing some of the responses to this global shock um, feeding into greater uncertainty and also unfortunately into protectionism and an absence of leadership. And those are sort of the three other big themes. So the first is the global shock, the economic shock and the impact that will have on prices, on demand, um, and also on our own productive capacity to supply the rest of the world with, as was said at the start, high quality and safe um, food. In terms of the uncertainty out there, um, unfortunately we are seeing incredible pressure on the rules architecture that's been out there that has provided us that certainty. And that's something that we need to work together to defend. COVID-19 has accelerated that uncertainty. We're seeing also the third big theme I want to identify for you, which is rising protectionism. You know, over the last 20 years, essentially protectionism, while it has been particularly challenging in your sector and certainly the most challenging sector for us um, in terms of pushing back against protectionism, but as a general observation, the trend was generally downwards. That is no longer the case. We are seeing um, major economies shoveling significant sums of money uh, into new subsidy programs for their farmers, new protection measures for their farmers uh, that will make our lives and your lives in particular even more challenging as you look uh, to compete on a, as level a playing field as possible. And that's a core part of my job is to make sure that we are competing on a level playing field and where possible um, getting some additional preferences that give us uh, something of an edge there. Look, the protectionism that we're seeing out there is of the direct kind, the, the kind of thing that Rowena mentioned at the start, the 200 plus million that you face in terms of direct tariffs. There are also the non-tariff barriers that are out there, which we estimated conservatively four years ago uh, as being more than $1.6 billion just to the agriculture sector alone. Um, we're also seeing a, 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 a somewhat troubling tendency to look to other mechanisms to try to keep, um, uh, to pr protect domestic uh, farmers in other countries. 
animal welfare measures, environmental standards. These are all the kinds of challenges that we're going to have to think about as we look out into the future in terms of that rising protectionism that we're seeing out there. And as I say, this is a non-trivial change to the working assumptions that we've had for more, dec more than two decades. So global shock, uncertainty, rising protectionism, and then I'm afraid to say there has been an absence of leadership from those that we would normally expect to lead and push back against protectionism. And unfortunately, the absence of any of those major economies to whom we would normally look for leadership has left something of a gap um, that the rest of us, the small and medium-sized um, WTO members, are looking to fill with some creative solutions um, to try to sustain and shore up uh, that very important rules-based system for us. Look, that brings me then um, to some of the very specific um, negotiating challenges that we face out there. And I want to start first with the World Trade Organization, where we continue to advance an agricultural um, openness uh, and liberalization and reform agenda uh, very vigorously. And we are not alone on this. Uh, there's a group of us in the Cairns Group um, where we work very actively with economies like uh, uh, Can um, Australia, Canada, Brazil, and others pushing in and reminding people that the protectionism that we see out there is bad for farmers, bad for prices, by the way, bad for the environment and bad for development as well. And that remains a core part of our negotiating agenda as we look out ahead. And in particular, it's about some of those indirect uh, protectionist measures, the subsidies to which I referred earlier. And of course, we're very, very mindful um, here in, uh, in my team that the beef and the sheep meat sectors in particular face very, very serious barriers, uh, and they remain a top priority for us to work through. As you will be aware, we are also in the midst of negotiations with the European Union uh, and also um, the United Kingdom. Those are really important negotiations for your sector, uh, and believe me, I am well aware of that. Um, you have some very uh, effective advocates, shall I say, in your uh, industry organization here in Wellington, um, and it certainly is good to work with them, but they definitely they definitely keep us uh, on message and uh, um, um, take us to task when they don't think we're pursuing your interests as vigorously as they believe we should. And they are right to do so. We are very cognizant um, in my uh, in my team of how important your sector is, both to employment, both to incomes, and of course well-being um, here, and crucially to your bottom line. So look, the negotiations with the European Union are our you know, third most important market with which we currently do not have preferences. And so we do need to push back against uh, what we're seeing out of um, the European Union. You'll be aware that there was a market access offer that the European Union, um, that someone on their side leaked. Um, and you'll be aware of the minister's very clear public view that that was an unacceptable both in form, in terms of leaking the offer, but in substance of the offer as well, that that was something uh, that he did not uh, regard as an acceptable offer, nor was it. Uh, so we have some distance to go. We have now done uh, two rounds in the post-COVID era um, entirely virtually, so you can be assured that these negotiations continue, even if we are not able, neither side is able to currently travel, but we continue these negotiations, and I expect we will um, after our election here in New Zealand, uh, we will resume those negotiations as quickly as possible. Um, for what it's worth, um, we have made solid progress with the European Union um, across a whole range of other parts of the chapters, but frankly, in your area, the area that matters to your sector and of course matters crucially to us, uh, there is a considerable distance to be traveled yet um, by the European Union. In terms of our negotiations with the United Kingdom, again, a very important market for your sector. Uh, believe me, we are well aware of that. Again, thanks to your advocates uh, here in, uh, in, in Wellington. Um, we have only just had one round of negotiations. We are going to uh, commence shortly a second round. Um, those are in the very early stage of the negotiations. Um, and it's fair to say that both um, our colleagues in London and indeed our colleagues on the EU FTA side have been somewhat preoccupied by their other negotiation with each other, the EU-United Kingdom negotiations, which of course um, has played out very publicly over the last couple of weeks. 
Um, so that's been another element in what we're trying to manage with them is, of course, we've got our own national interest to pursue, and we don't want that to be blocked by the, the challenges that they face um, between them. So that remains a very important part of um, our negotiating agenda. Just a few words, perhaps, on the, um, on the ongoing challenges that we see um, in terms of protecting our legal rights uh, in, uh, in Geneva. And I refer here, of course, to some very important uh, country specific, in other words, New Zealand specific tariff rate quotas in sheep meat and beef that I know are vitally important to the sector. Um, and to reassure you that this remains a, a top priority uh, indeed for the minister and certainly for me and the team here. Uh, and that process is unrelenting uh, and we continue to pursue uh, aggressively uh, our interest there, which is simply uh, to ensure that the, um, the outcome that was negotiated in 1995 in good faith by us with Brussels, um, that that is respected uh, as part of any outcome uh, that we see from them. So that's a snapshot of kind of perhaps arguably the two significant negotiations for you um, in terms of the future uh, with the European Union and um, the United Kingdom, as I said, two of the really important partners of ours with which we currently do not have any preferences. Um, just a few brief words before I conclude now on um, our trade recovery strategy. You'll be aware that about two months ago, the government launched um, the trade recovery strategy. I like to think of it as being in three clear parts, uh, what I call the three R's. It's the retooling of assistance to exporters, to people like you, um, to make, uh, to ensure that funds, uh, sorry, that our access is both protected and pursued, um, but also that we can help you in practical ways. We're very conscious that uh, many people are not able to meet their agents uh, offshore, their importers, supermarkets, and so on. And this is where the Ministry of Foreign Affairs can, can help. We still have an embassy network of more than 50 embassies offshore. They are there to help you. So the retooling of the way in which we think about supporting you is going to be a very important part of um, our trade recovery strategy. The other two elements of the strategy, the refreshing of our um, international connectivity, this goes to the heart of our negotiating agenda. It's about the free trade agreements that we pursue. It's about the World Trade Organization. It's about doubling down on pursuing that access, protecting your interests and advancing them uh, in that process as well. So be assured that we have very high on our agenda, um, the red meat sector, uh, that it remains a key driver for us uh, in our negotiating approach in a whole range of um, existing partners. And just to note also in terms of the refreshing of that architecture, um, we of course are hoping to expand um, the CPTPP agreement. Uh, as you will be aware, the United Kingdom has expressed a very keen interest in that. Um, and we are certainly welcoming of that uh, interest in um, working with them and of course our CPTPP partners to see how that can be advanced. Uh, and clearly there's an interest um, uh, on our part, both in terms of the bilateral free trade agreement and of course in CPTPP. The final part, so there's the, the retooling of exporter support, there's the reinvigoration of the trade architecture, and then there's the refreshing of our bilateral relationships. And that's a very active agenda by ministers reaching out to their counterparts internationally um, and re-engaging and refreshing those relationships to drive forward some of the uh, what we call the architecture um, that we hope uh, can drive uh, new market access, new opportunities um, for us who after all are a global leader in terms of safe uh, and high quality food um, to the world. And of course, you're an important part of that sector. So let me conclude there. Um, with the observation that, look, the world ahead uh, is certainly looking more complex and more challenging than we would wish, but that is not all driven by COVID. COVID simply accelerated an existing trend. So for the last three years, I've been talking about the end of the golden weather for New Zealand trade policy. I think that has well and truly happened now. And as I always like to say here uh, in Wellington, the question is whether it's going to be more Wellington weather or whether we can hope for more Auckland uh, style weather, um, and I'm conscious that Steph Honey is an Aucklander. Um, so, and as, there, as we have gale force winds blowing around Wellington, I am actually confident um, that no matter what the weather is, that New Zealand is a well-equipped 
uh, to take advantage of some of the opportunities that are out there to pursue our negotiating agendas, advance and protect our national interest in a whole range of processes ranging from the EU right through to the United Kingdom. And the thought that I want to leave you with is that we are not sitting on the sidelines wringing our hands and looking with dismay at the challenging environment out there, that non-trivial change to the way the world used to be, but we are, we are clear that we as a, as a country have agency here. And if I may say so, the crucial ingredient in my experience of our success has always been the NZ Inc component of that. Us working with your advocates here in Wellington and directly with you, the farmers and other producers and exporters, that to me has been the secret of our success. Our close collaboration, our working together, our being as transparent as we can with each other about priorities and so on, that gives me the confidence that um, in this world that is going to be challenging out there, and I worry about that, I have sleepless nights about it at times, um, but the secret of us being successful as a small economy as we look to plow ahead is going to be how we work together, how we ensure that we are well equipped to protect and advance our national interests together. So thank you again for the invitation, uh, Rowena. Um, it is a real pleasure to speak uh, with, with you and directly to your, um, to your stakeholders, indeed my stakeholders uh, as well. Um, but above all, uh, we know this is urgent, we know this is important, um, and I do firmly believe that the trade recovery strategy that we have currently underway is what we need uh, to take us through uh, what is going to be a more challenging time than usual. So my thanks again. Thank you, Vangeli, for that fantastic um, rip through all of the things that are going on in the trade um, policy frontier at the moment. So I've got a few questions that have come through, um, some in advance of the of the webinar. So I'll just start on those, but I'd just like to encourage people to ask any questions that they have. Um, I'm going to start off with a few questions around Brexit and the UK. So I just it's a question here asking for a bit more um, of an update on what progress has been made in the, nego um, in the negotiations or consultations with the EU and UK on their proposal to split New Zealand's TRQs um, for sheep meat and other uh, products. Um, these have been going on for a few years now. So what does that mean for New uh, to New Zealand sheep meat access to the EU 28 once the transition period ends at the end of the year? Um, and the UK leaves the EU, what's going to happen to New Zealand sheep meat and beef exports then? And how is the conversations going around our TR, proposed TRQ split? So it's a, it's a it's a good question. It's a it's a question that preoccupies me and my team here, um, and one we take. So let me make four observations on it. First of all, um, that process is ongoing, um, and it is a one that we continue uh, to work with our colleagues in, um, in Brussels and London, um, but it is a Geneva-based conversation because we are very clear indeed that these are legal rights that we negotiated in good faith in 1995 um, and that changes to this um, require our uh, agreement. And at present, we do not agree with the approach that um, both the European Union and the United Kingdom, in other words, London and Brussels, uh, are pursuing. So we've been always been clear about that. We've so our sort of ongoing work with those partners has been on the basis that we do not accept uh, the position that they are espousing, which is that they will split the quota um, between them uh, in terms of our access to those markets. So we don't accept that, uh, and we are continuing um, to work with them on what possible uh, options there are to find a solution. My second observation is that this is indeed. Um, a genuinely urgent question. Uh, we are very mindful indeed that the clock is ticking down um, on the transition period, uh, and we have we are ramping up our engagement and our lobbying um, accordingly. And in particular, I should note uh, this includes at the ministerial level. So there's been uh, active engagement there. For example, most recently with Secretary Truss, where Minister Parker made it very clear indeed that a resolution was needed to the question. Um, that this questioner has raised, um, but the, the proposal that the UK has on the table is not one we can work with, and I, I don't know that we can be much more clear uh, than that. 
the challenge we face, and let me be really blunt about it, the challenge we face is that, as I said in my presentation, London and Brussels are in the midst of a negotiation between themselves. Um, and that is a distraction for them. We regard that as their problem, not our problem. Um, so this work does continue, as I said, with urgency and it's ongoing. Um, but I did want to make clear that there is clearly um, some, something of a challenge between um, the UK and Brussels at the moment. Um, and, and you know that's no secret. You can read it in the newspaper almost on a daily basis. My final observation is um, in terms of what happens, um, let me just repeat what the minister has publicly stated. Um, uh, we have not ruled out any of the options open to us to seek to achieve a satisfactory outcome. Um, so I can't say more than what the minister has said, and I think he has been very clear that all options remain on the table in terms of pursuing our rights uh, related to um, those legal obligations that were negotiated by us in good faith um, in 1995. Thank you, Vangeli. So now we've got a question about the um, UK New Zealand FTA negotiations, and it's probably relevant to the EU ones as well. And so the question is, what indications are you getting from the UK on how they want to handle animal welfare and climate change uh, issues in our FTA with them? But I'd also extend, extend that to um, how's that going with the EU as well? So um, I, I'd like to make a, a distinction between the two. So obviously both issues are really important Actually, they're really important to us. Um, what we don't want is for people, so we do firmly believe, um, and I know I'm speaking to people that actually live this reality, that on both animal welfare and on um, the environment slash sustainable development front, uh, New Zealand's record stands up to scrutiny and is second to none internationally. And we're very clear about, about that. Um, and with the UK and with the European Union, we work very hard and very closely with them uh, around the range of issues uh, that we both see uh, on the need um, to work together, uh, you know, because our uh, New Zealanders, like Europeans and like the British, do care about animal welfare and do believe that's important. And so some of the work that you are doing is vitally important to sustain uh, that position um, and for us to be credible uh, in that area when this uh, when this issue arises, which it does from time to time. Um, on the environment uh, slash climate change, indeed, that is a feature of both negotiations. Um, I would make the observation that I always find it interesting um, that, uh, you know, take, um, so I'm the chief negotiator for the EU um, free trade agreement, and I've been public about the fact that um, we've been a little disappointed um, with the European Union. Um, the, the um, how can I put this? Um, so we have a shared, we have shared values uh, around sustainable development, about wanting to reflect the, the importance of climate change in the agreement. Um, and there's a good common position between us on that. Um, in CPTPP, uh, there is a, a chapter on environment and that chapter on environment has um, a dispute settlement uh, mechanism that in, that allows the withdrawal of um, trade. So in other words, trade sanctions and fines can be applied if you breach the terms of that agreement. Um, so if you breach environmental standards to get a trade advantage, um, then any one of us CPTPP partners can um, say, well, look, you're breaching the rules and we think um, that we would like a, to establish a, some judges to come together to consider the case. And if you're found to be in breach, then you need to bring your regime into compliance or we can impose trade sanctions or trade fines on you. And that's what CPTPP provides for. The government has very been, been very clear that it would like to have the same enforceability um, around the sustainable development chapter that we are negotiating with the European Union. Look, I'm very sorry to say that the European Union doesn't agree with that. They have a different approach. So while they have a, an approach that a, applies trade sanctions and fines on the rest of the agreement, in other words, when we talk about goods market access, if you try to cheat and try to raise your tariff, you know, you can be punished, or if you try to, you know, tilt the tilt the playing field in some of the certificates that we require, um, you can be taken to dispute settlement and then trade sanctions can be imposed on you. But that is not something that the European Union is prepared to agree 
in the trade and sustainable development chapter. So that we've been disappointed on that front, um, but we have been clear in our messaging and our public messaging and in our messaging in the negotiations that this is a really important uh, issue for us. Um, and it is one where we believe that we should both be leaders uh, on that front, um, but we should also make sure it's legally enforceable. But as I say, unfortunately, that's not the case for um, the European Union. They, they do not share that perspective. Thank you, Vangeli. I've just got a question um, as well about the US-China trade relationship and how you see that at the moment and what how is it affecting New Zealand? Has it affected us? Or what are the sort of risks for New Zealand from that, from the tension between the US and China? So yes, no, very good question. One that certainly preoccupies me. Um, so it is something we, we are observing with mounting um, concern and, and anxiety, um, perhaps less because of the risk to us directly and commercially and immediately, although I want to come back to that point because there are some potential angles we need to be very careful about. Um, it's the general sense of uncertainty that that creates um, and the fact that when you have the two major global economies, um, how shall we put it, not getting on, um, that's always bad news for the smaller and medium sized uh, economies that look to the larger ones to lead uh, the way or at least not stand in the way of, of progress. Um, in developing the international rules-based system. So the first point I'd make is that this is creating more uncertainty and more risk out there for business as you think about you know, what, what your market internationally looks like. My second observation is in terms of the direct risks, um, my first comment would be, look, we do have a free trade agreement with China um, and that has been a very positive um, part of our relationship with that country um, and a really important contributor to our kind of economic growth story and the way in which we, we weathered um, the global financial crisis uh, last time. And I think it will be a key ingredient as well for us uh, going forward. One thing that I think we are watching very closely is, um, as you know, the United States and China did do a what's called a phase one deal. Um, and we are watching that very closely to see whether or not some of the outcomes that were negotiated by those two major players um, affect our interests. Um, so for example, are they going to buy more beef from the United States um, or indeed more sheep meat? And what does that mean in terms of displacing our own product? And what preferential arrangements does the United States, for example, have into, into China or indeed China into the United States? Um, and where does that leave uh, the New Zealand interests? At, at the moment, yes, there are those risks out there. Um, we are watching them really closely. And if I may say so, and may, if I may make an appeal to your stakeholders today, if you have a problem um, with those markets or you're seeing a pattern of behavior um, in any of those markets, um, please do let us know. Uh, we are very committed to helping you address those barriers. As I said, one of our key focuses over the next sort of eight, 12 to 18 months is gonna be to help exporters overcome barriers so if you are seeing evidence of barriers in either of those markets or any other markets internationally, please do not hesitate to let us know. Uh, feel free to work through your very effective advocates because believe me, they'll be on my back uh, immediately. Um, but no matter which way it goes, uh, we are really here to help and we are serious about that. We've put additional resource onto it um, and, and our embassies, ambassadors out there are standing by to raise um, the issues that you may face in key markets we're ready to try to grapple with those on your behalf. Thanks, Sangeli. I've just got one more question and then I think we'll go on to Stephanie. But after Stephanie's presentation, obviously there'll be a chance for more questions. So, um, but uh, there's just a comment here. We've seen the protests in the, in the EU um, recently against the deal, the trade agreement that they had done with Mercosur because of concerns that Europeans have about the environmental standards or environmental situation in some of those countries in particular. I think it's been around Brazil and deforestation and impacts of, of um, production. So if that agreement was to fall over for those reasons, what do you think of those implications for New Zealand of that happening? Okay, uh, maybe I could make two observations. Um, my, my first is, um, uh, you know, much as there's a temptation, I think, on our part to think, oh, that would be good news if that fell over because there's an opportunity for us. Actually, I think that would be bad news. 
um, we ha we do have a shared collective interest in bringing as many countries together into a rules-based system where the rules really apply. Um, because I am a firm believer that in, when people do these negotiations um, and they make changes to their own systems, those changes and that certainty they provide will actually benefit all of us, not just the country that you've negotiated with. So I certainly don't hope or wish that the Mercosur agreement falls over with the European Union. Um, there are clearly um, um, existing challenges there, but maybe I could make an observation about our own situation. Um, the, as I said at the start, um, I am a firm believer that we have a really good message to send on the environment about the way in which we think, you know, the tikanga and the manakitanga that we bring to our own um, stewardship of the environment. And if I may say so again, you're a crucial part of an effective story. I think some of the protests that you see out in the European Union um, are, are a reminder though, how a story or a bad news story on the environment anywhere can quickly become magnified and become a real challenge for us in a negotiating sense. So I am really mindful that um, what may seem like a minor kerfuffle here in New Zealand on the environment rapidly zooms around the world and affects the perception of European consumers about our products. Um, so if I have an appeal, it is to be aware of, um, you know, we have a good environmental record. We need to be able to um, present that effectively internationally. And the areas where um, there are questions, we are willing to address those and tackle those in a meaningful domestic policy way. Um, and I'm aware of all of the challenges that um, we are needing to address in the environmental side. Um, and those are all helpful to us in a negotiating context in terms of presenting us as a real partner uh, to both the European Union and the United Kingdom on the environment front. Thank you, Vangeli. Um, so now I'm just going to introduce uh, Steph Honey, um, who's going to talk to you a bit about what Beef and Lamb's doing uh, at the moment to engage with the government on trade policy. Um, but I'd just like to introduce Stephanie first. Um, she's obviously, I mentioned before, our senior manager for trade policy. And she has a really strong background in trade policy and particularly trade negotiations with an agricultural focus as she worked for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade for many years and more recently has been a trade consultant. So um, just to give you a bit of Steph's background, she worked in the New Zealand Embassy in Brussels, where she focused on New Zealand agriculture market access into the EU and was New Zealand's chief agriculture negotiator in the WTO Doha round negotiations. So we're really incredibly lucky to have somebody of, of Stephanie's calibre working in beef and lamb on farmers' behalf. So um, just before I pass over to Stephanie, please um, ask some questions. We did get emailed some beforehand, but um, anything you can think of that you want to know, now's your opportunity to get something you can tell from Big Gilly that he gives you a good answer. Um, so now I'll hand over to Stephanie. Stephanie, you may not need to turn your mute off. You're muted, Stephanie. Mute, Steph. Apologies, everybody. That's a very uh, 2020 moment, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for that. Um, and I was actually going to say that I was going to take us from the lofty geostrategic and geoeconomic concerns to the more day-to-day -day business. And it doesn't get more day-to-day -day than being on mute. So apologies uh, for that. But um, very, very intimidating big shoes to fill after we've heard from Van Gelly, who I must say, just in keeping with the theme of this, uh, this webinar, as Rowena said, is a fantastic champion of our sector and of, of New Zealand um, prosperity in the world. So um, it's really wonderful to have the chance to follow him and share with you a few insights on what it is that we in Beef and Lamb are doing for the farmers um, and for the, the sector overall um, to help um, make your lives a bit easier. Um, so in a nutshell, I guess uh, our job in the trade policy team 
is to make life easier to get our fantastic products to our customers around the world. And to use some technical jargon, which unfortunately the world of trade policy is just absolutely littered with, um, our, our key theme is around market access. Now, as Vangeli has just explained, the world is full of barriers to market access um, all around our global markets. So there might be tariffs, uh, as you mentioned, or those non-tariff barriers, NTBs. And what they mean for us in the sector and, and you at the, the farm gate is that it becomes very difficult and expensive to get our great products to our customers. So the job of the beef and lamb team is basically to work very hard to identify those problems um, and try to tackle them and fundamentally to keep markets stable, predictable and accessible because, you know, that, that is what allows us to use the springboard of our fantastic beef and sheep meat and, and co-products um, uh, to, to share them with our customers. Now, we have a dedicated team of four people working on this important challenge. So in the, the, at the New Zealand end, um, I'm the Senior Trade Policy Manager, as Rowena mentioned, and we also have Nick Jolly, who works on these issues with me. Um, but we also have some, some representatives overseas in, in a couple of our very important markets. So we've got Ben O'Brien, who works at our office in Brussels, and Jason Frost in Washington. And then overseeing the whole exercise, we've got Dave Harrison, who is the General Manager for Policy and Advocacy um, here at Beef and Lamb. Now, of course, we work very closely with our colleagues at the Meat Industry Association too, because supplying those top quality products to our export markets, of course, begins on the farm, um, but it's really a team effort. We need the full value chain from the farm um, to our processing companies and our exporters, um, backed up by the, the fine colleagues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Ministry for Primary Industries. So on a day-to-day -day basis, what do we do? Well, we keep an eye on what's going on in markets, we do analysis, crunch the numbers, and we try to anticipate problems as they come up and deal with them in the, the best way that we can. If we see a problem, we basically work very closely with our officials, um, whether it's Van Gelly and his team or their wonderful counterparts at the Ministry for Primary Industries to find a solution. And a really big part of our work is supporting the government to negotiate trade deals or FTAs. Now, Van Gelly has already talked extensively about those, but I thought it might be interesting just to get a, a view of the landscape, if you like. What do those trade deals do for us? So, you can see from this slide, we've got pretty good access through our FTAs that Vangeli and his colleagues and predecessors have negotiated to date. And those trade deals basically help to generate better export returns that ultimately find their way back to you, the producers, and to the farming community. So our job in the Beef and Land Trade Policy team is to support those negotiations. So we might be helping with trade data, for instance, or or analysis, but a really important part of the job is advocating for our interests, for our particular solutions that we want. So we make sure um, that the negotiators have a really good understanding of what makes a commercial difference to you or to the processes or exporters. Now, sometimes we also lobby directly in markets, and I mentioned our, our colleagues Ben and Jason, very effective at doing that. They might talk, for instance, to a farmer group in Europe or America, um, we might meet here with staff at the embassies and we're, you know, very well known to the, the diplomatic corps in New Zealand. Um, and we also um, talk to other interested groups, to the media and so on. And a big part of um, that is really thinking hard about what it is that we're bringing to the table. So not just knowing ourselves what our great products are and our fantastic attributes of a product, but also being able to tell that story really compellingly. And I'm sure you're very familiar with the excellent work that's done with, for instance, our Taste for Your Nature campaign and so on. Um, now, Vangeli mentioned tariffs. And unfortunately, when I first started out in trade a long, long time ago, tariffs seemed to be on the way out. But they've had something of a renaissance, unfortunately. 
Um, and, you know, we, we did think for a while that the future was all going to be about non-tariff barriers, but um, we're seeing them come back again. And just to illustrate how noxious these things can be, um, we've got on the slide there um, a table that's slightly out of date now, but it really vividly illustrates how significant those things are. So as you can see from the chart, um, in 2018, we calculated that we saved $350 million through those FTAs that I talked about. That's obviously fantastic, and those savings find their way back to you, the farmers. But unfortunately, you can also see from the grey part of that the, the, the bar chart there that we still pay a lot of tariffs. So the work of Van Gelly and his colleagues is to try to get rid of those tariffs, gradually wear them down through the, the trade deals that we, we are able to negotiate. Now, another real headache, is, as I mentioned, and as Van Gelly talked about, are the non-tariff barriers. So it's sometimes called red tape. That might be things like a food safety requirement in a market that's not actually based in, in sound science. There might be restrictions around paperwork at the border being filled out a certain way or slow procedures. Now, sometimes these things are for valid reasons or are trying to meet a legitimate objective but often we find that they're actually just a disguised way of protecting local farmers. Um, and, you know, those non-tariff barriers can be at least as much of a headache as the tariff barriers. Another really major non-tariff barrier that Van Gelly also mentioned is subsidies. Now, some of our competitors design their production systems in a very different way to the way that we see farming in New Zealand. So farmers might get um, payments from their governments and the numbers are kind of in the crazy monopoly money sort of territory. Last year, for example, EU farmers received nearly 60 billion euros. Now, I should say not all of those are trade distorting. I give the EU full credit that they've done a lot to retool their support to become less distorting, but some of it certainly still is. Or in the US, um, over the last few years, we've seen some really major subsidies, um, for instance, around 19 billion US dollars in subsidies last year. So you can imagine all of that tilts the playing field against our products, not protected by tariffs, not supported with subsidies. And our goal in beef and lamb is to try to make our global markets as undistorted and unrestricted as possible. Now, a big part of that, as Van Gelly mentioned, is that we have the integrity and the credentials to make those arguments. So it's really important that at home, we don't do anything that is seen or can be um, presented as being trade distorting, like giving out big subsidies um, or, or you know, trying to really live our values around, for instance, as Van Gelly mentioned, sustainability or animal welfare or the highest of integrity in our production systems. And as he said, we have a fantastic story to tell there, um, but we also have to really hold ourselves to a very high standard. And overall, we've benefited hugely from the rules-based system, and we need to be sure that at every part of the value chain, so from the farm to processes to consumers to both sides of the political divide, we really champion those values and open markets and trade liberalisation. Now, we had a question already about the US and China, so I won't dwell on this slide, but um, I did want to mention that one part of our job is looking at the kind of strategic risks and opportunities that we might see out there in the world. And obviously something that's top of mind for a lot of people right now is this US-China trade tension. Um, now, obviously, uh, you know, when when, to use a, a great little uh, saying, when the elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. And I think, you know, we, we don't want to be the grass. So we want to see trade tensions among our trading partners resolved as much as possible. So it was really great news to hear earlier this year that the US and China had done a deal which looked as though it was going to take a bit of the heat out of that issue. Um, unfortunately, though, it's not completely unvarnished good news for us. Um, because part of that deal means that the US uh, has much better access to the Chinese market than before. And so that means that for us, we might have more competition in that market. Equally, though, uh, the flip side of that, we might find that the US has diverted 
product from other markets to China. So it's a very mixed fixture. And one of our challenges in beef and lamb trade policy team is to try to understand what those trends mean and go and lobby Vengeli about uh, trying to address them if, if we see that there's a problem that needs to be sorted out. Um, another thing that we do on a regular basis is supporting FTAs. Now, I mentioned earlier that they're really important for our sector, and so a big part of our work in the trade policy team is to try to make the case most compellingly to our negotiators for what kind of outcomes we want to see in those trade deals. And so I thought I would give one illustration of a great success story. I guess you could call it kind of the post child for red meat FTA outcomes, which is the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's a real mouthful of a name, um, but it's actually a really big deal for us. So this trade deal, which involves 11 Pacific Rim countries, um, has helped to secure new access for us into some markets where we didn't really have any good preferential access before. So really large global economies like Japan and Canada and Mexico, where there's huge potential. And so if you look on the slide there in Japan, for instance, we used to have to pay 38.5% tariff. So that's nearly 40% of the value of the product um, was kind of like a tax on the, the exports that we, we tried to send in there. And sometimes that would go up as high as 50%. But the outcome of the, the CPTPP agreement is that eventually those tariffs will go down to 9%. Um, and that's expected to save us $63 million dollars every year in tariffs. Now that is obviously a fantastic outcome for us. And it's not just about the dollars either. It's about keeping a level playing field with our competitors in that market. So the likes of Australia or the EU that might have done their own deals, we now have a chance to compete fairly with them. What did we do on that? Well, we worked very closely with MIA. Um, we talked to the officials about what we wanted. We lobbied the embassies in Wellington. Um, and we really tried to sell the case for a good outcome in that deal. And as Van Gelly said, we're really optimistic that that fantastic building block can be expanded to bring in more markets for us. Now, Van Gelly has already talked extensively about the situation in Europe. So obviously another really major part of our work at the moment is supporting the EU um, and UK free trade agreement negotiations. And um, just to focus on one aspect of that, um, I think, you know, a really important part of the arguments about trying to get new and better access into those markets comes back to sustainability, as Van Gelly mentioned, and we, and we had a question about that. So just to illustrate the sorts of things that we're doing on that, um, we've done research in the past on sustainability, so that the carbon footprint, if you like, of lamb, for example, to counter those arguments that I'm sure you saw extensively in the media a few years ago around food miles. Um, earlier this year, we made a submission to the Europeans um, about sustainability. You know, we're, we're not in the business of burning down our native bush to, to produce more beef. Um, but of course, it comes back to the fantastic story that we actually have to tell and the great job that our farmers are doing with Hewaka Ekanoa and through other efforts to really enhance our, our sustainability credentials. And of course, Brexit is a really major preoccupation. We've all seen those photos in the media, I'm sure, of the, the 20 kilometre um, lorry, lorry queues at the border doing trial runs for the, the post-Brexit world. So we're keeping a very close eye on possible market disruption, but also, of course, that TRQ split issue that, that Van Gelly talked about earlier. Just finally, a couple of um, pretty pictures to, to finish the presentation. So I mentioned earlier that a big part of our job is selling our story to the local representatives. So I thought it, you'd be interested to see a few photos. Uh, you can see in this shot here, we, had, we were very privileged to have um, the fantastic EU ambassador, Nina Obermeyer, and some of her team went out to farms in the Wairarapa to have a first-hand look at um, how uh, our farmers are tackling issues like biodiversity, greenhouse gas emissions, and water quality. Um, here's another shot uh, looking at, at some of the way that, that we run our, our farms, and all without subsidies. Um, and we've also taken our British colleagues out um, 
and to and to uh, look at some of our farms and our, our meat processing plants to see uh, how we do things. And finally, just to finish, um, we also, another part of our work, we're very committed to enhancing the next generation's opportunities and, and understanding of the sector and, and the opportunities there. Um, so we are engaged with some of our international colleagues running scholarship schemes for young farmers, um, which is really a wonderful way to bring along the next generation. And we, we're very excited about where those uh, dynamic young folk will end up, hopefully as champions for the kind of open, fair, um, sustainable markets that, that we're fighting for today. So that's it from me. Uh, thanks very much for listening and I'd welcome your questions. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so now we've just got some final questions. We're just gonna go for a couple of minutes longer. I think we'll probably finish up um, just before 10 past, just so people know um, what we're sort of aiming for, seeing as we start a little bit later. So I've just got um, a couple of questions here. Um, Stephanie, uh, we've just got a question asking about what sort of data and consumer insights um, are you able, that you gather from overseas, you know, from the people like Ian and um, Jason, how are we able to kind of get those back to farmers here in New Zealand? Um, well, that's that's a great question, Rowena. Um, I think that there's a lot of material on our website already. Um, and uh, one of the initiatives that we are hoping to get off the ground soon as well is a, a blog from the trade team um, because we're really keen we do have such a wealth of understanding from our, our colleagues overseas, but also from our own research. We'd love to be in touch more closely. Of course, we, we work very closely with, with the MIA, as I mentioned, and so we also share those insights through MIA to the processes. But if I may give a little shout out to the, the fantastic team at MFAT as well, um, they have been producing some amazing reports, uh, sadly, prompted by the extremely dreadful COVID situation, but their team, um, their network of embassies around the world, um, the, the MFAT staff and the MPI staff there and NZTE staff have been sending back fantastic insights about what's happening in global markets. So I encourage you to look at our website, but also the MFAT website for that, that great material. Thanks, Steph. And as you said, we are thinking about ways that we can better share with farmers some of the insights that we so we gather, particularly on the trade policy side, because it is it's quite a hard thing to kind of convey sometimes with things that we're sort of doing. Another question I've got here for you, Vangeli, um, it's about how does um, our government navigate its way through the complex Chinese geopolitical politics whilst maintaining our own current favoured relationship? So yeah, look, that's a that's a good question that um, that we certainly think about a lot here. Um, I think it is about being consistent and clear um, and and open um, in our discussions with China, as we are with our colleagues in the United States, in Brussels, and in London. So that there are no real surprises for any of our partners. And this isn't a China specific comment; it's a comment that goes to all of our partners. Um, uh, to give you a practical example of that, um, you know, we joined uh, a WTO case uh, as a third party um, against the United States because of the steel and aluminium tariffs that were imposed on us, which we thought was unfair. Um, and we also joined a case against China, again, as a third party in the World Trade Organization, um, because we believed that on uh, some intellectual property rights aspects um, that we thought that they were being unfair there as well. Um, and throughout that process, we had been transparent and consistent and I believe coherent in saying to all partners without fear or favour that we do believe in the rules-based system and where you are within the rules, uh, we don't have a problem. But where we think that you are breaching the rules um, or maybe breaching the rules in a, in a way that unfairly impacts on us, we are prepared, um, as the Minister have said in another context, to consider all options. And, and those do include include that. So my point about um, that really is about us being consistent and coherent and fair in, in the way in which we approach all of our partners um, around all of this. Um, clearly there are challenges. Um, you know, we do not like uh, what's happening in some parts of um, on Hong Kong, and for example, and the government has spoken clearly and consistently um, and transparently about that as well. 
But in my area on the trade side, it is very much about the coherence and the consistency of the messaging uh, that we do to all partners. And I like to think that even if they do not like the message they hear from us, they are not surprised by it, because I think that is an important part of our brand. Thank you, Vangeli. And then another question here about the EU NZFTA negotiations, a question about where we're at in the issue of geographical indications with the EU. Um, is this, uh, and, and is this a topic with the UK negotiations? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so this is pretty uncomfortable territory for, for New Zealand. We don't like um, GIs. Uh, we've been open about that. At the same time, uh, we do know that the EU has never concluded a free trade agreement without geographic indications being a major part uh, of the agreement from, from their perspective. So we are indeed in a process where we are talking about geographic indications and what that might mean, um, but only on the basis that um, we at the same time secure a satisfactory market access outcome. And that obviously includes the red meat sector as well. So if the market access outcome is unsatisfactory, um, then we have also been clear with the European Union that um, they will be disappointed on GIs as well. Um, so we do see the two. The minister has been very clear publicly about the relationship between market access and geographic indications. Um, and as we always say in these negotiations, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Um, so yeah, so we are very clear that it is a very important part of the negotiation for the European Union. Um, and we always say, well, uh, yes, how do we explain an outcome that gives you what you need on, on a range of geographic indications, whether it's feta uh, or whatever other product, um, porto or, you know, for wines, um, if we haven't got a balancing outcome, um, and that, of course, is agricultural market access. Great. And then I've got one last question, which is back to the Brexit process, which is obviously a really important one for our sector. It's just a question here about, obviously we talked about the new deadline for those new those EU UK negotiations for the UK actually sort of leaving, uh, I guess the customs union of being at the end of this year. And uh, the question was just, um, what, what's the likelihood in your view of that, ex that date deadline being extended? Um, and if so, when, when, when might we see that discussion start to happen? Because clearly, I guess a lot of exporters are going to have to prepare for that to happen, but when will they kind of get a sense that that might be delayed? Or how likely do you think that might happen? It, it's to me or to Steph or? To you, Vangeli, sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> Rats. Um, look, I, I can't give a definitive answer on that. Um, it, it really is a case of, um, I'm afraid, how long is a piece of string? Um, my own experience in Europe is, um, that, um, that, you know, Europe and of course the UK used to be part of Europe have, have always been good at finding uh, a way to, to close a deal and to find um, uh, an outcome. Um, so I'm, um, you know, given, given the equities on both sides, um, I'm still of the view that they will find some form of outcome that allows them um, you know, a relatively, you know, that they have some sort of outcome that allows them then to continue into the new year. Um, but look, I'm afraid uh, that's by no means guaranteed. And as I said, I have no special insights into this to offer, unfortunately. Um, and unfortunately, the uncertainty that's there is something that businesses and exporters and, and our farmers are going to need to continue to factor in. Um, I do strongly recommend um, uh, I, I would normally say the MFAT website, but look, to be honest, the NZTE website is a really good source of information, as is yours, about how you might think about, as in the beef and lamb one, as in how you need to be thinking about some of the risks that are there and the uncertainty that that creates and how you mitigate those risks and that uncertainty as far as possible. I don't think it can be eliminated, and I'm really sorry it's not in our hands, frankly. It's in the hands of Brussels and London uh, to find that deal. Um, but we are certainly following it closely. And we are, as you, as you very well know, Rowena, we're in very close touch with you about anything we hear that suggests it's heading in one direction or the other. Um, and of course, that will be shared with, um, with all of you. But I'm, but I'm afraid for now, it is a case of, um, yeah, I'm really sorry, watch this space, uh, but plan for uncertainty. Great. 
Thank you. Um, thank you both, Stephanie and Vangeli. Um, just one thing I just wanted to emphasize as well, actually, and it came across in um, Steph's presentation, but I just wanted to also emphasize that we really work closely with the Meat Industry Association. We see MIA a couple of times, but I wanted to clarify that that includes, yeah, that, that we, when we say that it's Meat, Meat Industry Association, we're really closely with them and, and the processing companies and a lot of the space as well, which is really critical for having a coordinated red meat sector um, voice on these things. So anyway, yes. it brings... That brings us to a close. You are a very formidable force, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd just like to bring things to a close today and thank everybody, um, thank our speakers, thank you very much, and um, thank all those that have taken part in the webinar. Um, so we're going to be, we have videoed this, so um, it will be available on our website shortly, and we'll also be sending it out in um, e-diaries uh, at the end of the week. So thank you, everyone. I hope you've learned something about both where, where things are at and also what Beef and Lamb is, is doing on behalf of farmers um, in, the, in the trade policy and market access space. Thanks, and see you later.